So now we're going to look at chapter 10, scene size of it. And here's where we start to get into the, the thick of things, if you will. There were, not that we haven't before, and everything is so cumulative in here. Everything builds on everything else, and that's what you know, I know that you'll you'll hear from from this point forward. But if, uh, if you're looking in your book, this is where we start section three, uh, 242, 243. We look at at uh, patient assessment. Chapter 10, scene size of chapter 11, the primary assessment. Uh, 12, vital signs, monitoring. 13, assessment of the trauma patient. You know, and on, you can look at the rest of them in section three. But chapter 10 starts on page 244. And uh, I passed out a, a patient assessment, uh, the, the checkoff sheet. You know, again, like I told you, that's your, your skills test. So uh, the <laughs> so you, you um, we're we're up front with this. Hopefully, uh, you know we're not going to give you test questions for the for the written test, but we give you the the test for your checkoffs so that you'll know. And we're going to show you how to do it exactly. And we we want to 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 be very upfront with this and not just say, okay, next Tuesday you're going to have a a skill checkoff and. Good luck. Be ready. So we want to do that, and this kind of starts this. the The book portion of this is going to get you ready for this. And like I mentioned yesterday, in uh, the, the chapter on the well being, this ties in with that as well. Part of the of the assessment, and really a lot of the scene size up is going to kind of revolve around you, making sure that you're going to be safe, making sure that. Well, you're the most valuable resource there. If it's if I'm there, I'm the most valuable. Resource. Whoever's there is the, the the EMT has a lot of time that you spend training, and the the whole core concept around this is if you go in and you become a victim as well, you haven't done anything to make it better. In fact, you've made it worse. So you have to really spend some time and become proficient at identifying what's going on in a way that's you know, time, you know, productive time-wise and making sure that you can enter the scene in a, in a safe way. Again, without beating it up, in uh, Chapter 2 we did, did discuss that. If there's an active shooter, and that's, that's not our, our gig. We're, we're staging you know, way away. And we're, we're coming in when the SWAT team has said, good to go, come in. So those are some things, identifying the hazards and you know, the looking for those key indicators is the big deal. I mean, think you're always going to be able to identify every single one. You know, we would go crazy. You'd never go in anywhere, would you? But looking for telltale signs that there's something that says, this is going to be imminently dangerous if I put myself into this scene, determine if it's seen, if, if the scene is safe to enter. You know, very dynamic. How do you know? And just because you determine that it was safe to enter once you get in, doesn't mean it's always going to be safe to stay there. Uh, MOI, mechanism of injury, and, and this is something you're going to add to your lexicon uh, that, that you're going to think about every time. Uh, yeah, I told you yesterday when we were doing a checkoff, BSI, scene safe. You know, BSI, scene safe. You know, determining those those scene safety issues are going to be real, real big. Yes. Can you remind me what BSI is? Oh, sure. Body substance isolation. And remember, it can escalate, right? So, what's our universal precaution that you wear? Gloves. And yeah, I, I hold my hands up, and you should say BSI like you're demonstrating that you have BSI. And then have the knowledge that it can build from there. You know, gloves are just what they're saying you've got to put on every time. Uh, so MOI, what MOI? What do you think that is? Mechanism of injury. And we'll, we'll use these acronyms. You know, really we 
start you with CPR and you're going to end up with, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of acronyms by the time it's all over. So what, how, how does MOI relate to anything? What happened? Did they fall? When it's what happened. Wreck? It is, right. And, and how was the wreck? We're, we're going to think about this, this, uh, this mechanism of injury and this will give us some starting points just to try to establish criticality of our patient. You know, we're thinking if you know you lean over and fell head first out of this window and landed in that parking lot out there, MOI significant or insignificant? Uh, yeah, I mean I'm going with significant. So yeah, if I kind of lean over and fall off of my chair, significant or insignificant? Could be, yeah, right. I mean, you you don't just necessarily draw, you know, say it's always going to be this and always going to be that. You know, you can see some surprising things, but this can kind of give you a, a start point anyway. Like I told you, vehicle accident on I-85. Yeah, we're going to kind of start with it's going to be significant, and we'll move from there. Determining what additional resources um, or assistance may be needed at a scene. So those are some of the things you're looking at, and that's the scene size of. And this is an important part. This is the first part of your, uh, your patient assessment. So, like I said, uh, scene safety is dynamic. Um, and, you know, what do we mean by dynamic? Changing. It varies. You know, what's going on in this picture? this vehicle from, from rolling over further. Uh, we're, we're making an assumption somebody's in here. Got in that ditch somehow, right? So uh, yeah, how do you make it safe? And that, that's one of the things I, I talked about. With, uh, you and your ambulance are working today. You have a duty to act and you're called to, the, to this location and there's that ditch down in that, uh, and there's that car down in that ditch. So what do you do? I mean, you're the first ones there. You just bail into it? You know, what's the problem? Maybe when you got there, maybe the this uh, this vehicle here was perched precariously on the side. And then when you got in it, that's when it fell down in there. And now what have you become, most likely? A patient. So it's dynamic. And, and vehicle accidents, I think about that a lot, because we're, we're going to vehicle accidents. And there's so many things that can go on with vehicles. I mean, it's not always like it is on, in, on TV or in a movie. It doesn't mean, you know, when, when two cars collide that one of them's about to explode. And, you know, we just got, there's a there's ticking. But you know what? It could happen. And there needs to be some things that you, you're looking for and you're keeping a, a, a keen sense of awareness uh, the, the entire time that you're there, not just checking off like we'll do in the lab, saying BSI, scene safe, and your, your proctor says the scene is safe, you got your BSI on, and then whoop, it's in the back of your mind. Well, in the real world, obviously, right? Obviously, it's, it's evolving. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change. So um, we, we keep uh, another term there. You have to maintain a, a high index of suspicion. Index of suspicion. That Okay, uh, yeah, here's this Jeep or this, this vehicle, is that, is that a Volvo? It's down in a, um, it's down in the ditch. What's going on with it? You know, what, what happened? What were they carrying in the back? Um, are there any fluids leaking from the, from the bottom of this? And if there are, there are what is it? You know, because if it's gasoline, I'm a lot more concerned. Uh, you know, how, how did I know? Can I smell it? You know, you're using your, your senses to try to make, make sure. So. We have to make sure this scene is safe, number one, for us, or two, for the for these patients as best we can, and three, for the bystanders. And one of the hardest things to do as an EMT, as a responder, is to, you know, think about it, kind of seemingly do nothing. An unstable vehicle, for whatever reason, you know, I can insert myself in there. You're going to take risks, but you have to, you have to minimize the difficult situations that you're going to put yourself into. 
and make sure that you're not going to become part of the problem. So the best thing to do in some cases is to, you know, hey, let's communicate with the, the victim in this accident. Stay still. We've got more help coming. We're going to stabilize your vehicle, and we're going to get you out. And that might be the thing that you have to do in those, those cases. Um, pull out your trauma assessment sheets there. Everybody have them, have them sitting out. So um, look at your at your scene size up there. And again, uh, in, in the way we start to teach this, we teach it you know, in a very linear fashion right now. Not to confuse you, but the patient assessment model can, can, um, it can move around. But we'll, we'll teach it, we're going to go from starting point all the way down. And, and that's how we start to look at it. So before scene size up, see what the, the point there that you can get and what's that? What's that, what's that one? And what, what's, the, uh, what's the point that you can get before big bold letters for scene size up? Yeah, you see, you see the possible point out to the right? Oh, okay. That's what? BSI. All right, so you've gotten your point now because you said BSI. All right, so now uh, we're then, you know, and, and imagine what's happening. Where are you in the scenario? You've gotten a call and you're responding to a vehicle accident. And you're on your way there. And what are you thinking in a vehicle accident? You know, and it depends on where it is, right? You know, if it's in a, if it's in a neighborhood with a posted speed limit of, of 25 versus, you know, I, I beat it to death versus I-85, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a difference you're probably thinking there. So, you're you're thinking about the possible injuries. You're thinking then about the MOI, the mechanism of injury uh, of the patients that you're going to encounter. So, you're you're thinking, oh, BSI, I got gloves. Do I need more? What's the reports from the scene? Dispatchers are receiving information and they're relaying it to me. But you know, I've got to get there and we've got to see first before we start to make some some determinations. So yeah, you know, the, the elements that I'm looking at, I'm taking standard precautions. I'm checking that scene safety and I'm keeping in mind that it is very dynamic and we've alluded to, made mention of, and we'll practice and we'll get out and go to the lab and we'll we'll practice hopefully today some looking at um, the things we're going to think about checking scene safety. Think about that apartment. Going into that apartment. How do you know it's safe? Yeah. Have you ever pulled it out? Mm -hmm. Now, what if you think it's not? What are you going to do? Yeah. And, and what are those things that give you the indicators that it might not be? And what I'm saying is, we're not trying to create a paranoia. We're just trying to you know, say, you as the resource, as the healthcare provider, are valuable. And if you see things that lead you down the path to say this isn't safe, you take the, the precautions to make it safe. There's some obvious things, and that's kind of what we look at. So checking that scene safety, the, the dynamics of it, think, considering that it's not, if it's just safe at the beginning, doesn't mean it's always going to be safe. Noting the, the MOI, the mechanism or nature of the patient's uh, mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. So we're looking at MOI when we're looking at our trauma. If it's a illness, we're thinking of NOI or nature of illness. So here's some acronyms for you. MOI, NOI. So those are things we're looking at. Determining the number of patients. And this is real important and it's real important right up front. Why? Yeah? There you go. Yeah. And so, uh, if it's a bus wreck and you're the only ambulance there and there's 17 patients, can you put them all in your ambulance? No. So, you know, it would be noble to just jump in there and start working away and maybe save a life or two. But if you don't, right from the start, radio for more resources, there's no reason to think that more resources are coming. And, and yeah, that's the, the bottom line of that. Uh, determining number of patients and the criticality of them based on MOI may really be the, the, the difference, literally, for life and death. 
So we, we drill <coughs> and we train right from the very start. So deciding what additional resources may be necessary. You know, and is our additional resources based on the number of patients or is it based on the criticality of the patient? And you know, is it my additional resources another basic truck or EMT truck? Is it an, an advanced life support truck? Is it a helicopter? So those are some of the things I'm looking at. And you know, here's a here's a pivotal one right here. Consider spinal immobilization. And this is pivotal because this is transitioning me from my scene size up into my primary circle. And so when I've gotten to this point, oh shoot. No, when I've gotten to this point, I'm, I'm now thinking, okay, I'm about to start assessment. And I've evaluated, and you're, you're really this consideration is, is going to be based on if you, if you have this here, if you have an MOI. Do we have an MOI in, in process of this patient going through this mechanism of injury? You, know, you, you can answer this, could they have injured their spine? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to start off with spinal mobilization and you're going to provide for that spinal mobilization. Okay? So, the only predictable thing about emergencies is they are often unpredictable and can pose many dangers. So, you know, picture here one of the most unpredicted emergency scenes ever, maybe. Um, there's so many things that, that, that can happen, the, the strange things that can, that can occur in an emergency scene. And like uh, Lyndall said earlier, uh, for some of you, that's kind of the thing that makes this kind of job exciting. For some, it's the thing that makes it the thing that you don't want to do at all. Because if you're living with that low-level stress of that, at all times it can be bad. So to, for me, finding that common ground in the middle saying, yeah, I need to be a drilling junkie and I don't want to live with the stress all, all the time. I've got to figure out a way to do my best to assess a scene in a way where I'm eliminating as many risks up front as I possibly can. And to me, that's where I found that common ground and try to make my scene, scene safe all the time. Saying that the only thing that uh, are common about all of them is unpredictable, you know, is true. But you know, try to make them as predictable as possible. What's the call? What are you going to? And how can I, you know, from second I leave the station to the time I get back, how am I making myself as safe to be? And you know what? And this is part of that culture change I was talking about. That's the attitude you have to have, and that's the attitude you have to take. If you're gonna, you're gonna make it, you're gonna survive. You can't just take this for granted. So, okay, I'm gonna show this. Uh, let, me, let me copy this. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go back and show this. Remind me of this, but um, yeah, this is uh, something that's worth seeing, and some of you might have. I'm gonna show this this YouTube video back here in a little bit. All right, think about it. Um, what potential threats? Uh, to emergency providers, are there at an EMS scene? What are potential threats to emergency providers at an EMS scene? Uh, explosions. Yeah, explosions. Gun What's that? Gunmen. 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 Hazardous, materials. Hazardous materials. Hazmat. Bills, gas. Bills, gas. You know, and, and traffic. <laughs> traffic. You know, you know, very good. And you know, I alluded to. Um, one of the things that kind of gets to you, and, you know, like I said, showing some of the journals, um, some of the websites you can go look at. One of the things that really you know, bothers me, and I think about all the time, to be quite honest, is the line of duty deaths you talk about. And specifically, you know, there's levels of things that you can justify, right? You know, maybe. You, you think we had an EMT that. Um, pulled somebody out of a, a kid out of a fire before it exploded and he covered his body with it and he ended up dying but he saved the kid's life and you're like, hero. Man, that is awesome, you know, and he gets the posthumous Congressional Medal of Honor and, you know, that's, that's great, it's sad, but it's great. To me, the thing that gets me is um, 
the ones that tunnel vision themselves when they see a you know, jeep down in the in the in the ditch, and they're thinking, I've got the tools, I've got the knowledge, I've got the uh, the know-how and the the methods to go in and save a life and park stage but looking at the vehicle, get out of the truck and <laughs> hit by a car. Done. You know? Was he being a hero too? Yeah. Or she? They were. I mean, they were going to go hell. But you, you've got to always be on guard on that. And, you know, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic on it, but you know, it seems like every year there's emergency responders that are hit by traffic. And, you know, to me, with again, without trying to sound overly paranoid, Everybody out on the roadway is trying to kill me. They are. They're trying to get me. They're trying to gun me down. And you know the uh, the people on um, on the interstate. Everybody on the interstate is 15 minutes late. And by going 15 miles per hour faster, they're going to get there just about on time. And so the posted speed limit is 70. They're going 85. And if they see lights and sirens, you know if they're not blue typically, or if they're already on. You know, they've already got somebody, so they're getting on by. It's, it's, that's real. And if, you, if they're red, they might even turn them on faster. Gun them down. And so, you know, you think, people will slow down. They don't. And, you know, you've got to be on guard, and you've got to make um, the concessions to make yourself as safe as you possibly can when you're working in a scene like that. Because uh, the other thing people are doing, too, is they're trying to see something. They're not looking at. They're not looking at what you may be doing as an emergency responder. They're looking over. Is that, is that car on fire? I might see something crazy. They might have their phone out recording as they go by. <laughs> Smack. So you know, keep that in mind. Dispatch. It's our starting point. They. They don't. They it, not may not. They don't have complete information. Uh, you know, so many times you think about it. You have just the keen sense of awareness of what mile marker you're at on the interstate. Some don't. Some, some do, maybe, but most don't. And um, so many times we've got a call from I 85, I'm headed northbound when they're headed south. And I'm at mile marker, you know, probably 52, and they're at 58. And uh, there's this car, and it's, it's, it, it rolled over in the ditch. And it's, you know, on the shoulder. So you, that's the information they got. They can only go with the picture that they got, and they, they give it to us, and we try to sort it out. It's not the dispatcher's fault. They're interpreting information and trying to send the right resources out. But they, you know, they can be a start point for you to, to start your call, and that's where we might formulate it. Okay, it's on, hopefully it's on the right road. Hopefully they are on I-85 and you know, not you know, on uh, East University. So. You're, you're, you're starting from there. Uh, the thing, you know, may be very dif different on arrival. And I think every person that's done emergency response probably has a war story about this. And, you know, I've got a bunch, but I won't bore you with that. The, the big thing is, you know, you can use this call, this dispatch call as a, as a start point to kind of get into your mind what's going on. You know, hopefully it's not just completely different. We're going to a motor vehicle accident, and it's a, you know, a, a static. You know, you know, hopefully that's not the thing. So um, th that can be where you, you at least get that, that MOI versus NOI in your mind and, and start moving down one path maybe of trauma or, you know, as, as opposed to a nature of illness. So that's kind of where you can start with it. So some things you think about the scene safety uh, considerations when you're approaching the scene. You know, what's going on? Dynamic situation like Lindell said the other day, um, yeah, it was about two years ago. Y'all remember there was a tornado that went through Auburn? Mm -hmm. Remember that? I was working that day, and uh, right before it, I mean, there's a horrendous rainstorm, I mean, there's a there's a vehicle accident, like right before it. And so we're out in the rain, you know, and then we're on scene on a, on a vehicle accident, and Dispatchers get a report that says you know, the emergency units out of station be aware there's a tornado in East University. Now, do you know what? You don't know how East University goes around Auburn? Mm -hmm. It does a big circle. Okay. So I'm 
when we get to thinking, where on East University? Because, you know, East University makes a big circle around the city. So, where is it on East University? So, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, it, it makes a big difference to me because I'm pretty close to East University or I'm pretty far away from it, on where it is. So, considerations approaching the scene, you know, what are the weather conditions? What's going on? As you are getting a call, there, a lot of times you can kind of have a, a consideration. I know where I rode the ambulance a lot. I knew that if it started to rain, I'd just go ahead and sit in the ambulance because we're about to get a call. This is about to happen. So, you know, what's what's happening as you're approaching the scene? What are you doing to make it uh, to make it safe? Look and listen for other emergency units approaching. And you know, hopefully your apparatus operator, your driver of your ambulance. Is keeping their heads about them and you know remaining ha having an overall sense of calm. The thing that I found is you know, you get your your adrenaline down a little bit because that you know, extra five ten miles per hour you know, usually doesn't amount to a whole lot in the, in the big picture. Yeah. And if you're going to get there, you need to get there carefully and cautiously. And you need to pick the right place to, to stage to to park your vehicle. So that's something you got to look at. Look for signs of a collision re related power outage. Um, true story. So I went to it. We get a call for a car wreck. Um, young lady. Uh, it, you know, it, it was 2 a.m. ish, and uh, she had hit a power pole. And uh, I think she'd been enjoying herself, you know, having some libations. Let's just say. So uh, she had, had hit a power pole and she completely snapped it in half. And the and the, the power line was on the ground and it was arcing, you know, it was dancing around. And um, police units got there first. We got there. When the police units got there, they had to, you know, ma'am, step back. She saw that arcing line and it looked like a fire, and she was trying to stomp it out. Bad idea, right? Lucky she had been drinking because she didn't have the coordination to, to stomp, stomp it enough, right? So you, you think about it, you, you tunnel vision yourself into thinking car wreck right here, and you don't see power line right there. And as you're staging your, you know, your, your gurney, your, your spine board, the stuff that you're going to do to save this life, you set it down on a power line and it's all you wrote possible, right? So, you know, you, you, this is just kind of an idea to get that big picture of what's going on around you. And uh, you've got to do the best you can in these situations to, to see the big picture. Uh, what's hard for me is if, if you are sitting, four of you are sitting in a vehicle, you know, your driver, the thing I'm going to kind of do is I'm going to try to, you know, look around it first stage my truck in the right place to give me a working space. I'm looking underneath to see if I see any gasoline dripping down from it. And as I approach, I'm going to try to approach for you. I know the hood's right here. Hey, if you can hear me, don't move your head. You know, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, things like that. You know, what do people do? Are you okay? I'll say, don't move your head. Are you okay? Try not to shake your head, okay? Okay. You know, they, you know, they keep going. So, um, yeah, and then the thing before I'm getting in the car, I'm going to get a foresight and look at this car. I'm coming back here and I'm looking from the back and seeing just any fluids underneath. Before I put myself in it, what's going on with it? And if I get in there, you know, is that when it's about to Hollywood blow up and we're all five of us, you know, going to see the big guy? But, you know, you've got to establish the way that you're going to do things, and you got to do it early, and it's got to be the way you do it all the time, and there needs to be no exceptions. So I'm always going to assess and look at the scene and make sure I'm protecting myself, you know, because I'm the resource that's going to help. I'm going to triage these people and see who needs the most help first, and I'll start to make these decisions, and we'll move from there. So looking for those things, observing traffic flow, and how can I get other units in here as I need them. Look for smoke in the direction of the of the collision scene, and you know more times than not, than not, it seems like vehicle accidents where you have is called for a vehicle accident, the car on fire, 
it's usually the, the dust from the airbag inside the car, and people think it's a fire. But uh, hey, it's not always the case. You don't you you can't always just say, oh, it's just the you know, it's just the airbag dust, because sure enough, one of them is going to be on fire one day. And then you know, how are you approaching for that? So when when you're in with the, within sight of the collision. I look for clues to, to escape hazardous materials. You know? Typically not going to see you know, uh, a protected uh, um, or you know, placarded hazardous material in, in a sedan. But you know, do you have a, a transfer truck? You know, do you have a, an 18-wheeler? Uh, is it a tanker that it's carrying? You know, right? Those are things you'll they'll, they'll kind of pop to like, okay. Okay, that'll be okay. I'm staging uphill and upwind. So, uh, look for victims, collision victims on and near the road. Look for smoke, uh, not seen at a distance. Uh, again, broken utility poles and downed wires. And, you know, and it can happen more often than you think on that. So establish this methodology for when you're approaching a scene, a vehicle accident scene, that you're just not like there's mangled car jumping out, ready to go. No, staging right. I'm, I'm typically staging with the back ends of my car kind of blocking traffic. So as I get out of the driver's side, I got a space. So if somebody's coming from behind me trying to run me down, they're, they're going to have to work to do it. You see? Within sight of scene, be alert for uh, persons walking alongside of the road towards the collision scene. A lot of people want to help, and they come in to, to you know, legitimately provide help. And you know, you come in and with duty to respond. If you're the EMT working on a truck, and that truck gets the assignment of, of working this vehicle accident, you have duty to respond. But it doesn't mean that everybody there, you just need to like, everybody get back. Somebody might have some, in, some information that you might need to know. Somebody might have some expertise that you could utilize. So, you, know, you again have to come in with this model if you're you're kind of taking control of the scene, but it, it's kind of tough. You kind of bring organization into chaos, and you have to do it sometimes diplomatically. <clears throat> Watch for signals of police officers and other emergency personnel. Know your limitations. You know, it seems like we've seen a lot of these things this this summer, haven't we? Feels like it's never going to stop raining sometimes this summer, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, a lot of swollen uh, creeks. There was a rescue I uh, heard in Prattville the other day. Uh, a family got was trying to kayak on a on a little creek there, and it, and it was was swollen, and um, they needed a rescue. So you're called to this, you know, uh, possible near drowning event. You know, patients suffering from respiratory distress. You go there. And they're sitting out on this rock. I think I'm gonna inhale some water. Okay, well, all right. We're, I'm gonna swim out to you. You know, what's your limitation? You know, what? When does your duty to act stop, and your duty to get more resources come into play? The, uh, uh, you know, obvious scene right here, right? But you know, sometimes in those gray areas, you have to think about what are my limitations to provide rescue calling for that additional resource. Uh, where is our nearest swift water rescue team? And that's who we're calling. Man, they're out of Montgomery. Get them on the road. We're standing by right here. Clock's ticking. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, is there a point where you're just like, Psh, taking them too long? You know, you're just diving in. No, and then you're, you're becoming part of the problem. Scene safety considerations as you reach the scene. Uh, follow instructions of the of the incident commander. Don appropriate uh, protective equipment. And there's a you know the, you'll you'll take a a course called um, ICS uh, 100, 200, uh, 700. Anyway, these these courses are online and they're through FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and they're designed to kind of uh, integrate you into some of these uh, this terminology, kind of common terminology. Uh, incident commander is just a decision maker on the scene. 
in, in, in uh, emergency services, it will typically be the first officer that arrives at an emergency center. And he'll establish a command and they'll just start a they'll start a decision making process. And you know the, the whole idea is you're not just kind of willy nilly everybody charge at it. It's hey let's unify and decide and make decisions from there. That's the, the short version of it. Uh, and of course you're donning appropriate uh, personal protective equipment. And you know you, you could end up looking like that if we need to. You know, it's kind of starting with this, which is what? BSI. Yeah, BSI, the universal precaution, we're just going with gloves. We've got a multi-system trauma. You know, we've got a, a bad bleed. This, this is very appropriate, right? Danger zone, evaluate the, the hazard and restrict area based on the threat level. Different hazards require different size danger zones. Um, working at Auburn University, at Auburn, uh, the city of Auburn, we go to the university on occasion, on a lot of occasions, and sometimes there's, uh, you know, there's been, there's a lot of research that's done on campus. There's a lot of things that we don't even know about over there. There's some rooms and buildings, and we walk through every building every year. There's some rooms and buildings that say, you don't need to go in there, and they don't give us key access to it, and they say, if this room's on fire, pull everybody out and let the building burn down. What the going on there? They do DOD research, Department of Defense research on some of these things. And, you know, so you know, this is where you might be thinking our threat level is high. You know, you're, we make decisions based on, you know, the, the, the key issues are life safety and property conservation. So is there a life safety issue or we can save property, but at a certain level, it's just too risky. And if it's risky for the responders, then you gotta, you got to pull back. Um, hazard areas a lot of times kind of revolve around like a, a, a material that might have leaked and is causing a problem. You might, in this call, I might call that a hazardous material incident. So in these situations, you try to get a best guess for what is the substance, identify it, and then you don't know what's it doing to people. And then we just start getting people out of there. And that can be, that can be tough. So it requires different size danger zones. You know, we see a chlorine, you know, we know that we have a chlorine leak somewhere. It's, um, it's in a gaseous state and it's leaking out of here. You look in what's called an emergency response guidebook and we see chlorine leak, evacuate one half mile radius around the leak. Find which way the wind is blowing and evacuate a mile that way. So what do you do? You do that. Think about think about evacuating an area and how many resources it would take to do that. It takes a lot. So you know you, you you start to look at these things, and that's points where you know you you have maybe hundreds of responders on the scene. You, you can look these calls up. Like a lot of times they might happen in a big city, a train wreck. I remember there was a a bad uh, a, a, a transfer truck wrecked in a tunnel in Maryland. And that was a nightmare. I think it might have been like it was like a chlorine gas cloud coming in out of a, out of a tunnel. And that's a nightmare. Anytime trains were at, horrific. You know, look at a train, and we're not doing the hazmat chapter right now, but look at a train and see what placards come by. They got a lot of stuff on them. And we got trains that run all around, the grid, right? So you got to be aware of that. Evaluate for the threat of violence. You know, and hopefully, based on your call, you, you might have a key or an indicator. Hopefully, you're not being blindsided. <laughs> and like our our crew out of um, Gwinnett, up in uh, around the Atlanta area, they thought they were going to help somebody have a heart attack. And my favorite war story. I can't confirm that this happened or not. It wasn't mine, but an instructor I had. He was a old grizzled old paramedic out of Montgomery area, and um, he said uh, he and his partner went to a call. Uh, in the Montgomery area, a little lady called, said her husband's having a heart attack. So, you know, they get out of their truck, they grab their cardiac monitor, drug box, one gets the um, oxygen cylinder, one gets the, and he gets a spine board, and they're coming in to save a life. And she says, he's down into the hallway, last door on the right. So, let's have them kind of walk in, you know, they, they get there, and they go into the door, open it up, and in here. 
go and make sure you're looking in the bed and he's not there. They come back out and she's standing down at the end of the hallway with the shotgun. <laughs> she says, um, I'm leaving this world today, boys, and you're going with me. Uh oh. <laughs> what do you do? I'm thinking run for us, run. Um, you know, they ended up, his story is they ended up kind of talking her down. They queued up the radio. Said, now you need to drop the gun. You know, and kind of gave indication of where they were. And they ended up kind of talking down. They ended up with a, a, a hostage kind of SWAT situation, kind of like what they had in Gwinnett. And she ended up being shot and killed by the police. You know, 70 something year old lady. Yeah, they might call that suicide by police in a lot of cases, right? And then they, he said they ended up having to treat her. She did not live. So, yeah, can you expect that? Do you see that coming? I mean, do I, am I saying, I, am I trying to create for a paranoia in you? No. I'm just trying to say all we can do is do the best that we can to look for indicators that there might be a, a circumstance, a situation. Uh, and those, those violence, the domestic violence, ones, you know, they can take you by surprise. Uh, they can happen. There, there's no um, you know, socioeconomic boundaries for domestic violence. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen over here in this neighborhood versus over here in that neighborhood. It can be everywhere. It can be anywhere. And you, know, you, have, to be, you have to be aware of it. Fighting loud voices. Weapons visible or in use. Signs of alcohol or drug use. Unusual silence, uh, knowledge of prior violence. So those are some things that you're going to kind of look at. Light is really good in my opinion. Provide light. Uh, move furniture around to kind of suit you. Move the patient if need be, and just if, if you can do so. Pay attention to the bystanders, and um, you know if it's a if it's a fight, if it's a violent scene. Me personally, I'm, I'm not going to be there as a medical responder without a police presence. I'm just not going to do it. You know, I'm, and, and this isn't saying that you know we we couldn't maybe necessarily you know defuse or talk somebody down, or that we might maybe couldn't necessarily defend ourselves. And that's not what it's about. Let's just you know think about what what our role is and what we're doing. And if there's um, a fight going on and somebody's injured and we're there. Our role is to provide uh, medical care. Our role is not to restrain somebody who's broken the law and then possibly arrest them. What are citizens arrest? Citizens arrest when you boo. <laughs> Maintain an escape route. You know, in, in these situations you're going into that, yeah, you're scanning, you're looking for problems, finding where your patient is. And you're not letting somebody get between you and your means of address. Hey, it's just you and your partner. Let's back out. Let's get some more people here. We'll be back in a minute. You know, you're documenting that. Hey, they left. They abandoned that patient. The scene was not safe. I should, we shouldn't have been in here. You get it? Stay calm. Be alert. Be open-minded. Uh, bar room scenes can uh, become quickly volatile, volatile and unpredictable. Uh, be patient. Do not antagonize. You know, it can be easy to jump into that. And, you know, typically, you're in the bar room late hours, you know, and you might have had a long day, and it can be easy to fall into this, you know, antagonizing of, of your patient. But you got to try to avoid it. Don't turn your back. Have one, one partner monitor bar patrons at all time. Uh, if, if it becomes threatening, retreat, and call for help. And here's my number one uh, rule on uh, bar scene. Everybody leaves. Yeah. <laughs> you turn the light on in a bar, and they're gone. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, we're turning the light on, and turn that music off. And the next thing you know, the whole place is empty. Like, yes. Now I can treat the patient. So, you know, that and you bring a few police officers in there, which we don't go in there without a police officer anyway. What is that? Yeah, clear out quick. So. Mm -hmm. Although any call can present potential safety hazard, what types of calls might pose uh, the highest threats of potential violence? 
Right. Subjective kind of thing. What? Weapons. Weapons, yeah. Uh, definitely. Yeah, domestic, yeah, domestic violence, violence, right? What's that? Well, then I guess not violent. Yeah. Yeah. True, true. Could, yeah. And all, all good thoughts. And I think, you know, the big point is you're kind of thinking of this. Um, you know, to me, if, if somebody is going to take the, the time to try to uh, um, you know, harm somebody in a way where they want to kill them, they probably won't have any second thoughts about harming me if I'm trying to help that person they're trying to kill, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you've, got to, you've got to think through these things and do the right thing in that if, if you're called there, we're, we're not going to go there. Don't even put your, your ambulance on scene before police are on scene. And, th and that way you're kind of avoiding you know, somebody running up to the car. Like, you've got to help them. And then, yeah, who is that running? Yeah. Did, did this person... Is this the person that's shot or stabbed? Yeah, you know, let, let's just try to avoid that. Big thing too, in this point, we're we're trying to say is is this a trauma call or is this a medical call? Because we're we're kind of going down two different paths in a lot of ways. If it's a um, it's a trauma, we're we're really thinking this golden hour. Significant trauma that we know that. In that golden hour, where do I have to have them? It starts when the incident happens. It's a shooting, it's a stabbing, that's a trauma, and this golden hour comes into play. And you know, statistics say if we're going to save them within 60 minutes, I got to have them <coughs> surgery. You know, they got to be cracked open and whatever bleeding inside because somebody, you know, ruptured this vessel with a gunshot or a knife, it's got to be corrected surgically, or else they're, they're, you know, their, their odds of survival go down significantly. Or i got to be thinking nature of illness. And you know, NOIs typically are kind of are going down a different pathway. We're, you know, still, you're still doing all the things we do in our primary survey, but uh, you, you know, if they're not critical, we're thinking, you know, this is chronic issue, what led them to this point, how do they get the care that they need from that from that point forward. All right, uh, yeah, significant MOI, insignificant. Significant, yeah, again, you're going to this vehicle accident and you know, you've been called to this one and you arrive on scene and see this, what are some of the things you think? Multiple patients, okay, good. All right, look at your sheet and think through the, think through the from the start. What kind of BSI? Might you need more than gloves? Mm -hmm. All right, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, could they could they be really bad injured? Mm -hmm. Like, could there be a lot of bleed? Could there be a lot of body fluids? Especially if they're faced with the steering wheel, all of yeah. that. <laughs> sure, absolutely. And yeah, I, we don't see our, our victims, our patients here. We don't know exactly how they, you know, what happened here, but you can imagine. What does this, um, th this mechanism look like? What happened? Yeah, you know, look like one, look one of them got hit, hit, and then one of them had a lateral, like a T-bone, right? Maybe this one was coming out of the um, the cemetery here, and this one coming this way, right? So think about these forces, and and we'll look more at it. But the person in the in the frontal collision, they typically are going to do what they call either an up and over, like they're going up and over the steering wheel. Or they're going down and under. So, you know, it, was this an up and over or a down and under? And what's happening in our lateral collision? So, did this hit on the? Look at this. Was it on the driver's side or the passenger side? Driver's side with this mechanism of injury. What do we think is going on with this driver? What's that? They're probably pinned in there. Could be pinned in there. The driver's side door is probably. Driver's side door. Is this a is this a complicated extrication? Call it? Like you know, so is it going to be easy for me? To, can I just get the driver's side door open and get them out? So yeah, more resources right from the start have to be called. Maybe even more resources called on the initial dispatch. We have a 
two car NBC, one car has rolled over. I hear that. I'm saying, let's go ahead and send another, let's go ahead and send another fire truck, just in case. If we don't need it, I'll turn it around. If we do need it, we got it. So the fire department has the A lot of places, yeah. Yeah, it kind of depends on what, what it's set up. So I know we, in Auburn, we have them. In Opelika, the, the fire department has them. So the annual service is basically just transporting the patient as they get them out. And the rescue is left up to the. What is your role if you can't get access to the patients? You've got to get the resources there so that you can get access to them. And so, you know, that involves pre planning, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you're this responder, you got to know who are the people that I can call to get what I need, to get the right resource there. And that's, you know, that's part of getting involved in a system and finding out what the resources that you have available to you are. So, you know, significant NBC, and, you know, I'm thinking we're calling a lot of resources in. Uh, this is going to be a complicated extrication. Uh, you know, you're starting to triage if you're the first ambulance there. You know, again, first thing I'm doing right here, I'm assessing, I'm walking around before I, I stick myself into the scene. I'm seeing what's flowing out of this vehicle. Can, can I get myself and, my, and the responders that are coming here access to this safely? And then we start to do the things we need to do to, to, to get to this figure. You know, this, this door is probably uh, had to have a you know, jaws of life open a hydraulic access also. It looks like those were pried open. Uh, yeah, this is a significant incident. You know, you look at this right here, you, we know we had a driver in this vehicle. And I'm thinking probably based on MORI right now, he's going to be lucky to, to, to make it out of this and make it to the emergency room. And probably where I might start just before looking at it, is this is going to be my most critical patient, this driver right now, right? Y'all agree? Mm -hmm. You know, think about that force that hit him. So if he's pulling out right here and how does the body go? Yeah? All right, so, you know, this, this force came at him like this and it shifted his body this way. And what, what came in on it, maybe the, the door came in and pinned him. If he was unbelted, God forbid, he might have even been ejected out of the window on the passenger side. And then if he was, the car rolls over on him. What do we got there? So, you know, that force is that, that kinetic force that's the MOI that you as the EMT are looking at this vehicle and thinking, okay, what's, what's critical here? Are we considering C-spine control? Think, think about that. How how did that impact affect him? And you know where where are the critical injuries going to be on him if he's belted, let's say, on his left side, right? Yeah. So he, he 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 goes that way, or she goes that way. Injury, you know, trauma on, on that left side. Unbelted, where are they? All over. He's probably thrown out of that driver's seat. If you stayed in the car, it rolled over. You know, then if you're rolling over. So MOI, we're just thinking those forces that cause the injury, and this is this is anything. You know, on the fall, you're, you're falling down. How do they land? And we try to predict how they landed. Fall out of that window head first. You know, how did you land? Were your arms up? Did you just swan dive it in? <laughs> yeah. What are, the, what are the injuries you're getting there? You're doing the best you can to, to try to predict those injury patterns even before you see your patient. And then, you, you know, because then we're going to start treatment real early. You know, we're still approaching everything the same. I mean, EMT, can I help you? Does he respond? This gives me some information. Does not respond? We're going to start treatment. And this is kind of from the legal chapter. We spot, respond, or we get, we give treatment then based on what? So we we got to get their permission to do it. But if she doesn't say anything. We're we're getting one. Say it again. Implied consent. Nice. You were trying to report, didn't you? Okay. So, so implied consent. So if you know, if we go by if. She knew that she was in the re in this wreck right here, and 
And if she had the wherewithal to say so, she would say, yeah, dummy, I need some help, help me. And so there's implied consent. She, she would say if she knew that she was in a wreck, she needed help, so therefore we did. So if she says, yes, help me, that's what? Express consent. So we're, we're getting consent in some manner before we begin treatment. And I don't think we've mentioned that yet. So here's our MOI. What should we be looking for with this? Quickly. Down power lines. Boom. What did she hit? Power pole. So, you know, how many victims do we see here? Is there anybody in the back? Maybe. That's right. Hey, we're, we're looking. We're getting a, we're getting hopefully a four-sided view of this vehicle. What else do I need to know? Before I do it, I'm looking at these power lines. Does this seem like they're up? Is there any laying on the ground? kind of stuff like that. Uh, can be useful in predicting the injuries, those MOIs. Um, what, what do you think these, these folks, what kind of injury might they have had on this? You know, when, do you, when do you have that up and over versus the down and under on that frontal collision? You think? And we hadn't talked about you know, kinetics of trauma yet, but think about it. What does your vehicle do when you start to break real hard? Does it kind of lurch you forward? Mm -hmm. So if you've kind of lurched forward, if you see, if I see, you know, 28 feet of black skid marks there, we assume they've been breaking, right? So then that would have put them kind of forward, right? And then when they hit, what will they do? You know, they'll, they'll hit and they'll kind of go up and over. What if you see no skid marks there? They might not have break. And then, the, the, you know, you got to evaluate it, but a good possibility might be the the down and under. And down and under versus up and over. Up and over, we're thinking maybe more injuries to the face, to the upper part of the chest. Down and under, we're thinking maybe injuries to the pelvis, to the, to the lower extremities, to the legs, etc. Both, both very serious, and both that we still consider ceasefire. Absolutely, right? Yeah, based on this. We're thinking, um, is there a good bit of intrusion into the a passenger compartment is there are the airbags deployed you know that kind of stuff significant deformity greater to the vehicle greater than 20 inches uh, and we have that we have that right intrusion into the passenger compartment displacement of the vehicle axle look at that <coughs> rollover down and under. <laughs> Rear end, you know, what's your, the, the, the victim, what's their mechanism? You know, they're being, that, that line of force comes back from this way, right? You have your whiplash. Roll over, and it could be all over, right? Restrained, unrestrained, those are things we're looking at. Falls, burns, NBCs on a, on a recreational vehicle. You know, jet ski, um, four wheeler, motorcycle crashes. You know, anybody's ball game on that one. Sports, football, pedestrian collision with a car, truck, bike, or other force. You know, so uh, a kid versus an adult being hit to kind of different injury patterns. You know, uh, an, an adult, they say, is going to have a tendency to try to you see a car coming, you're going to try to run away. So you're going to have kind of lateral and rear type um, uh, strike by the vehicle, and they're they're tall enough. Where are they going to go? Typically, they're going to go up and over. Um, a, a child has a tendency you know, to hear the screeching of the tires and the the horn, and they turn forward. They turn towards it, and then they're hit, and they go down and under. And there's more a chance that they're going to get run over by the vehicle also. Blast injuries from explosion. There's uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary injuries that you're going to receive from that. You know, the primary being just the shockwave. Stabbing, shootings. Uh, severe injury, fall more than 20 feet. A uh, child under 15 uh, years of old, fall, uh, fall more than 10 feet. Or two to three times the child's height. And those are just rules of thumb. You can be very lucky. 
I, I think Corey and I uh, told you about that that reaction that I had the other night of the little girl that was a toddler that fell. She had, she ended up falling. It's probably about 18 to 20 feet. There wasn't a thing wrong with her. They ran every test. I followed up on it. They they let her go that evening. Kept her two three hours. Did did all the tests, X-rays, checked it all out, ran her through the whole gamut. Does that happen ever? No. You fall 20 feet, it's gonna be in trouble. It was on on campus. Uh, anybody familiar with that? Um, the the uh, women's athletic facility down there on campus on on Sanford Avenue. Did you fall off that little um, that ledge? Really? Uh huh. It was before they closed it down for people to go up there. <laughs> so she she was just big enough. She fit right through those little those little bars, and she just did. And just shoo, straight down. So you never know. Significant MOI. They they packaged her, of course. They transported her, and she was presenting just fine. But you you do that based on precautions. Those of us out in the field, I mean, we don't have a an X-ray machine out there. We don't have a um, you know we don't have access to a CAT scan or an MRI. You know we can't we can't diagnose differentially out of the field. We just look for signs and symptoms that that can lead us that this is what's going on. If that MOI is significant, guy, and I'm looking up where she fell. A long way. So important factors on the fall, the height, the surface which they fell on, uh, part of the patient hit the ground, uh, anything that interrupted the fall. I had a girl from a party at an apartment complex. I don't know what she was doing. I think I, I think she might have been trying to jump into the pool. Oh, there's their floor, third floor balcony. I think. I don't know. She was altered. She was on some, uh, some ETOH, that's alcohol, and um, <laughs> she said. And um, she uh, had fallen off, couldn't get up. She had compound fracture of her arm, so the bones, the bones out. And uh, you know, we were concerned with, uh, with other things, too, with her, her neck. She didn't want to go to the hospital. I'm good. I can get this fixed. I don't know how I want to go. <laughs> what do you do there? Can y'all fix it? Can y'all wrap it up? You can't do that. Can you just leave it? Well, if they don't want to go, you just have to... Yeah, you, I mean, you still have to convince her that yeah. she oh, she I needs to go. But still, like, what if she's just like, I'm not going? Yeah, like, what if you can't? What if they maybe just... Right. Like, their elbows sticking out. You know, it, there's, there's points, too, where you make decisions based on the... the, go, the, the well, you, sure, she can sue us, and we have to make decisions based on the uh, the, the patient's uh, ability to properly mentate. You know, is she making good decisions? Is she altered? And you know, ordinarily, if she had fallen. If she was not altered on some type of substance, we determined that she, she would say, "Oh my God, take me to the hospital quick." There's bones sticking out of my arm. She's like, "No, is she good? Can we just put it back in?" No. That's not. You're going to be in surgery. No. So, um, you know, they're, they refuse to a certain point. Can you just take them? No, we can't. But then we're we're still documenting these things and saying, is she conscious, alert, and oriented person, place, time, and event? She couldn't do that. Is she? Um, does she know what's happened and the extent of what her injuries are? No, she couldn't tell you that. And so then there's this decision-making tree, and, and there can be a lot of factors involved in that and it can even go up to like a probate ju judge possibly to order to take her against her will. Now when you have significant trauma like that, you know, things can be expedited in ways. But you know, she ended up was gonna be arrested if she didn't go for public intoxication. And then when she got arrested they they were just taking her immediately to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But she ended up consenting to go, thank God. <laughs> so you'd be surprised what people do. Low velocity knife injuries uh, could be multiple wounds. A lot of times, it's, somebody's going to stab somebody. You're going to stab them a lot of times. Never know that, but look for it. Um, medium velocity uh, handgun, shotgun, high velocity rifle uh, injury could be anywhere on the body. Uh, the damage uh, is from the bullet from the bullet itself. You know, it's going to cause cause a pathway, and it has this cavitation. 
whereas the, the movement through is it picks up tissue, it, it creates a bigger hole. There's a small hole where it enter, enters, the size of the bullet, and it's a bigger hole where it blows out on the other side. So your exit wound is bigger than your entry wound. A blunt force, uh, a blow that strikes the body but does not penetrate the skin. You know, we see this a lot, a baseball bat, you know, a stick, you know, something like that. Signs are often subtle and easily overlooked, especially on a trunk. You, know, you might not necessarily, you're, you're looking for signs or, or indicators that there's an issue rather than you know, the, the obvious bruising or deformities themselves in that area. Maintain that index of suspicion, and there's my term, based on that MOI. Nature of the illness is the reason that you're you're called um, to for for EMFs. You could get it from the patient themselves. Hopefully that that could be your most reliable family and bystander standards in the scene. And you know when you're dealing with this nature of illness, we're really very much in, in, in this point. We're, we know we're going to start taking a history, and that's probably going to be our the thing that we're going to look to do. You know, trauma like like um, Linda was saying, in trauma, you got a bone sticking out. Know exactly what we're going to do with this. We're going to control bleeding, and we're going to splint maybe in place, and we're going to provide for transport to get her the help that she needs for this. If somebody's just saying, I don't feel good, you know, we're, we're still making determinations whether it's, if it's critical or not based on airway patency, breathing adequacy, and circulatory deficits. But you have to gather information as to what's causing it. So you, you, you can kind of see the differences there. Number of patients, how many are there? What, what resources do I need? What other specialized resources might I need? Fire, tech rescue, hazardous materials. What about this one? What do y'all think? Okay, BSI could go up. Uh, do you need additional resources there for scene safety? Yeah, you know, I'm interested too. I mean, this leaves it open, wide opening. To, if it's a poisoning, you know, what do we mean by that? Poisoning. The, is there something loose? Is this a hazardous material scene? Yeah, and do I need a hazmat team? Or is it an overdose? What are we typically thinking of on an overdose? Drug, maybe you know, legal prescription drugs or illegal drugs, and if somebody overdoses, maybe they're trying to trying to kill themselves. Maybe if they're going to try to kill themselves, will they kill you? Possibly. Right, right. So you know, what are the the resources you might need in these situations? Widespread police. I definitely get police there, without a doubt. Potential for. You know, we're a BLS truck, a basic life support truck. We might need advanced life support, advanced life airway, uh, advanced airway rather. So, you know, lots of things can come to mind, right? Think about these critical thinking skill questions that you see in your book too. Uh, what are the routes of entry into the body? Nose, nose, mouth, eyes. You know, nose, mouth, a lot of times mouth. You know, we're thinking, did you ingest it or did you inhale it? Right? You inject it. You know, did, did, did it absorb into you? Yeah. What can we do to prevent children? Educate. Yeah. Move it to higher places. Yeah. All right. Any questions on scene size up? And we we went a long way in this, and uh, I, I, there's there's a lot to this. It's more than just you know, is the scene safe? R real quick to go back through it. Let's start with PSI and look through those those points that you can get on your patient assessment and scene size up. So. I demonstrate that I have body substance isolation. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to determine 
is the scene safe, which we've talked about is very dynamic. We're going to determine if it's an MOI or NOI, and we're evaluating if it's critical or if it's significant or insignificant, right? We're making these just from seeing this, just from taking this thing in, we're, we're trying to make these determinations. We're going to see if we can determine the number of patients. Why do we do that? Right, request additional assistance or additional resources. And then we, what's the last thing? Consider stabilization fine. And that's important because this leads us into our next chapter, uh, chapter 11. This leads us into primary survey. Okay? So, BSI, scene safe. Determine the MOI. Number of patients, additional resources, stabilization is fine. And you guys start going through this tonight and getting used to you know, look at this checkoff sheet and go through that tonight and think of scenario. You know, like, like we said in this book, not in this uh, PowerPoint, and create some scenarios. It might be something that you, you've driven up on and think, all right, if I'm on an ambulance or a rescue truck and I have a duty to respond, what are the things I'm doing? How am I thinking through this in the patient assessment model? And this is where I told you that methodology of thinking and moving through a patient assessment, this is where it starts with this the scene size up. BSI, is the scene safe? MOI or NOI? How many patients do I have? Do I need any additional resources? And do I consider the stabilization of the spine? So tomorrow, this time when I ask you scene size, you know, quiz for tomorrow, maybe give me the six points, starting with BSI and moving through the last one in your, uh, in your, pro in your scene size up. What are the things you do in the order that you do? Remember, we're kind of thinking, teaching it kind of in a linear fashion, right? And then the six Yeah. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, we're going to, we're going to hit uh, primary survey next. But uh, questions on that? Okay.